we're live. Okay, I see people are joining. I'm just going to wait a few more seconds. Hello, everybody. Hello, welcome, welcome. Just gonna wait a few more seconds, everybody, to make sure there's no one who's meant to be here who's a bit late. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna start with the introductions now while we wait for the remaining few people. Um, hello, everybody who is watching and welcome to Africa Fashion Week London's Masterclass series. Um, I hope everybody's having a really good day today. Um, if you've been following uh, AFWL for the past few weeks or the past few months, you would have seen um, a lot of really interesting things happening. Um, you know, while we've been on lockdown during this whole pandemic, you know, we've been doing seminars and panel talks and you know so, so many different things that have been going on so this month in june uh afwl is doing a series of master classes which i'm sure you know because you're here um but make sure that you do go to the afwl website to check out the roster for the month of june because there are so so many uh really incredible speakers on some really really interesting topics that will be going on throughout the month which brings us to today please welcome Dr. Stephen Danziger, who uh, will be delivering a talk on the title, The Next Wave of Smart Connected Fashion, How I Found Style, Wellness and Joy in a Trainer. Um, so I'm just going to read a quick introduction um, and then I'm going to hand over to him to deliver his masterclass. Uh, welcome again for the people who just joined after I said the welcome before. Um, oh, also for those who don't know me, my name is Agnesa Momodu and I will be uh, hosting, hosting the masterclass. I mean, it's a masterclass, so it will be him, but I'll be back for the Q&A session at the end, so you'll see me there. Um, so welcome to Dr. Stephen Danziger. Uh, Dr. Steve played CBGB in Max's Kansas City in the late 70s. He drank, he played drums in a toy rock band and then got sober in the late 80s. He became an international educator and a rocker again in the 90s and is now a sought after clinician, writer and meditation teacher. Dr. Steve has attempted to cure Mark Maron on his world renowned WTF podcast. He became a master of EMDR uh, therapy and a provider of EMDR training and advanced topics courses and is a pioneer of the Buddhist recovery field. Dr. Steve is the head of health and wellness innovation and partnerships at Drop Labs, which is a company that was started by Susan Paley, the former CEO of Beats by Dre. Um, the creators of full immersion sound technology delivered through Bluetooth to vibrational footwear simultaneously with your headphones. Steve's techno uh, technology company, Start Again Technologies, develops, collaborates on, and acquires applications to deliver through Drop Labs uh, hardware to enhance his meta protocol, uh, meta standing for mindfulness and EMDR treatments, templates for agencies, uh, and add new dimensions and interventions to many other health and wellness platforms. Steve is also currently part of the third cohort of the Master of Healthcare Innovation, the MHCI program at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, studying and collaborating with fellow cohort members and faculty who include doctors, nurses, academics, researchers, uh, and administrators to continue his quest for finding innovative solutions in mental health care and wellness. Dr. Steve is the author of Clinical Dharma, A Path for Healers and Helpers, EMDR Therapy and Mindfulness for Trauma-Focused Care, which, uh, which was co-authored with Jamie Marich, um, and Mindfulness for Anger Management. He blogs and podcasts on topics relating to mental health, recovery, and mindfulness. Besides maintaining a private practice in Los Angeles, he travels internationally speaking uh, and teaching on Buddhist mindfulness, EMDR therapy, the Meta Protocol, trauma, uh, Buddhist approaches to treating mental health issues, and clinician self-care. He has been practicing Buddhist mindfulness for over 30 years, including a one-year re uh, residency at a Zen monastery. And he teaches Dharma classes regularly in Los Angeles and other centers internationally. 
So to find out more about our very special guest, Dr. Steve, you can go to his website, drdanziger.com. That's D-R-Dr-Danziger, D-A-N-S-I-G-E-R.com. Welcome once again to Dr. Steve, who I will now be handing over to for his masterclass. Thank you, Eniafe, and uh, welcome to everyone here. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. Uh, I'm gonna do uh, some PowerPoint today. Um, and so let me get that going. And here we go. So I was gonna say good morning, but that's me. Good afternoon is my guest. Uh, and uh, again, my name is uh, Steve Danziger and Eniafe, thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction. And I am uh, honored and privileged to be here uh, with you all today. Um, I'm going to uh, let you know that Eniafe actually covered all of this. Uh, the only things that I, I want to uh, sort of um, add or uh, say uh, a little bit further is I have been uh, doing uh, Buddhist mindfulness for over 30 years. And when I lived at the Zen Buddhist Monastery, I think we woke up at about 4 a.m. every day. And here where I am, it is 5 a.m. So uh, that practice uh, helped me in a number of different ways and prepared me for uh, such an occasion as this. And I'm glad to be here. Uh, this is a wonderful way for me to spend uh, my morning. And uh, I'll also uh, uh, amplify, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, that I did you know, spend a good 20 years in the, in the music business um, that uh, put me in, in you know, just sort of in the middle of uh, the uh, world of entertainment, the world of uh, fashion, the world of, um, uh, of creatives. And that was just one of the most wonderful aspects of my life. Uh, today, uh, I am more the therapist. I do have my drum kit set up uh, in the other room, um, but that's how I work things out. And uh, it's not how I, uh, what I do for, for my work. And so what I do for my work at this point is what led me to be able to uh, have this relationship with Drop Labs. And I'll say a little bit more about that, um, but I thought I'd start with a more uh, general description of uh, smart connected fashion and the history of it. And just you know, right up front, I, I guess some of what I just said is the caveat is um, there's probably people on this call or watching on Facebook Live who are more expert at all the various aspects of what I'm talking about than I am. So just know that I come to you as uh, uh, someone who has experience within this uh, field and I bring a lot of aspects to it, um, but most of what I'm doing is learning all the time and partnering all the time and um, collaborating all the time. So that, this, this kind of presentation just gives me another opportunity to do some more of that. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, so, um, for years now, um, at least in the 2000s, uh, it's really uh, become very common uh, for all kinds of products uh, to be made digital if they can be made digital. Um, if there's a way of either uh, using data or acquiring data or uh, uh, producing interventions or producing um, information uh, and we can connect it to a product, of some kind, um, then we will. And so the idea of a wearable, um, you know, has been a long time coming, you know, pre-digital age, uh, you know, think Casio watch, things like that, um, even a Walkman. Um, and uh, so now uh, we have a plethora of these opportunities with the most well-known ones up till now, of course, uh, being uh, watches and bracelets. Um, and uh, those being a wonderful place and opportunity to uh, have people be able to both track through sensor technology. Uh, you know, the, the, the wrist uh, does have a, a good amount of information coming from it uh, as uh, regards, um, you know, breathing rate and heart rate and all that. Uh, and uh, people over the last uh, again, I, I don't want to put a number on it, but you know the wellness craze or the uh, people being focused 
on their uh, self-care as it pertains to being able to track um, their, uh, the level of their fitness, the level of their wellness. Um, that's been going on for a while. So it makes sense uh, that the first place was the wrist and in these kind of products and that the first real uh, mass use of, uh, of uh, connected fashion would have been uh, wearables like this. And now we're uh, at the next generation or we're in the next generation of uh, our opportunities. Uh, we're heading towards places so quickly, um, you know, probably like during the time I'm giving this talk, something's gonna happen. Uh, so uh, now uh, anything that can be worn uh, is uh, being leveraged. And uh, a lot of how uh, smart connected fashion works has to do with its ability to uh, interface uh, with apps on a phone. Uh, as, as phones become less phones and more, uh, you know, I've got a, a, a computer in my pocket uh, and we're using them to connect to uh, either software or hardware, um, applications that uh, help us to enjoy ourselves or to feel better or to keep to a, a fitness program, all the different things that we do. Uh, now, uh, putting this kind of technology into uh, all kinds of uh, technologies, uh, I'm sorry, all kinds of textiles and all kinds of fabrics and all kinds of um, wearable, uh, tech. And so uh, you can look at the history of uh, how uh, it's progressing to the point uh, where uh, in the first generation of uh, wearable, um, wearable technology, uh, you see just a, a sensor, taking a sensor and attaching it, uh, similar to uh, the way that the sensor is either part of or attached to the, the uh, bracelet or the watch or it, it sits within it. Um, you're now uh, seeing, or you, you have been seeing uh, Adidas, Nike, Under Armour, you know, basically just putting a sensor, attaching it to their apparel. And then the second generation products are where the sensor is embedded in the garment somehow. Um, and so the product is made, the, the fashion is made so that the sensor can be, uh, can be uh, embedded right within the product. And now, and it, it's happening, um, the third generation, it's where the garment itself is the sensor. And uh, the sensor technology is throughout the garment. The garment is made of the sensor. So, uh, Timeline on this, uh, I don't know if anyone still uses the Bluetooth headset, uh, people walking around with a blue dot in their ears, um, but that uh, we could say that is uh, the beginning because uh, it was uh, a wearable, it was uh, something that um, people uh, put on and people would see uh, and it would uh, change the face or change the, uh, the appearance of the person. Um, and then 2006, Nike uh, and uh, with uh, Apple uh, put together a fitness tracking kit. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, going forward. 2009, you see the advent of the Fitbit. Um, and uh, 2012, uh, smart watches started to become a thing. This is before the Apple Watch came out. Um, a company called Pebble, uh, they were one of the early darlings of Kickstarter. Uh, and uh, it didn't it didn't go well in the end, um, and, but um, that was the first uh, sort of mass uh, distribution of of a watch uh, that had uh, had capabilities uh, beyond uh, the Casio watch or or anything that wasn't digital. Google Google uh, has been developing Google Glass uh, since or around 2013 or 2013 was when it uh, uh, came to, uh, came to market. Um, and uh, that's where uh, your, uh, your high-powered computer is, uh, is with your um, uh, glasses. And uh, um, uh, Tommy Hilfiger has uh, had a solar-powered jacket and then a number of other 
uh, fitness and activity trackers came out around 14. And then 2015 was a big deal uh, for, it actually was a big deal in my life uh, because I was actually working on a smaller wearable project. And when the Apple Watch came out, um, at that time, uh, when the Apple Watch came out, Fitbit lost like 70% of its value. They survived it, obviously. Um, the company that I was working with, uh, we didn't uh, come to market. We had our wearable put together and it was gonna be about health and wellness. Um, uh, and so the Apple Watch really changed the game or sped up the, the race towards uh, wearable tech. And uh, Ralph Lauren had their uh, Polo Tech shirt come out and, uh, and then uh, Google has their Project Jacquard, which uh, I'm gonna talk about in, in a little bit. So um, as an example, Ralph Lauren's Polo Tech shirt uh, works with your iPhone or the Apple Watch uh, to put uh, workout data right in the palm of your hand and you can see uh, down in the torso, uh, a detachable black box that streams the stats directly to your iPhone or iPod touch. And so uh, the shirt uh, fits snugly, uh, which helps the uh, sensor to fit snugly and be able to catch uh, accurate data. And so uh, then, uh, as with many of these uh, uh, wearable, um, wearable devices and wearable uh, fashion, uh, you um, have a dedicated app that um, helps to make sense of the data or creates a program out of the data um, that can be customized for the person who's uh, wearing it. And um, that's a big part of the, um, uh, the um, what is good and helpful about uh, this kind of technology and this kind of fashion is how it uh, allows us to customize uh, to make it uh, very personal. So Google's Project Shikard takes backpacks, shoes, jackets, uh, you know, so Drop Labs, uh, our company did not uh, start the idea of footwear being involved in, uh, in this movement. Um, but uh, so putting uh, new digital abilities and experiences in uh, these products uh, while they're still, you know, a backpack or, or a sneaker or a trainer. Um, and so uh, Adidas GMR uh, where, and that's uh, your, uh, that's uh, football as in soccer, as uh, we call it here in, in the States. Um, uh, so those uh, sneakers are designed to help uh, soccer players get a more definitive idea of, of how they are doing, what they are doing in their training. Uh, Levi's trucker jacket where you can answer calls, play music, you know, basically uh, you know, either through a touch or, or you know, number of taps, uh, being able to set up your jacket or, you know, uh, backpack. Uh, to understand the things that you want to do most often and setting up your own personal menu of uh, what your uh, wearable is going to do um, to assist you in life. Um, and so uh, the City Backpack by Saint Laurent and uh, that allows you to control music, drop pins on the go, take pictures and do more with a, a simple gesture. So uh, as the technology gets smaller, and as the technology, the, the smaller computer gets more powerful and more interactive, uh, the opportunities and the possibilities grow. Uh, Nike Adapt uh, is, was, is a platform um, that uh, through, uh, helps you with the, uh, your lacing of your, uh, of your shoes and making it so that you are able to adjust um, your Nikes uh, and also um, adjust the technology aspect. And uh, so uh, the app, um, and this is, uh, you know, Drop Labs and other companies are all learning from each other. And that's actually a big part of this uh, presentation. And my hope is, is that uh, it's just part of uh, uh, movement and, and a help towards um, all of us um, being able to help each other to create 
more wonderful products that uh, help more people, bring more joy, uh, bring more wellness. Um, but uh, they have uh, one for activity and one for relaxing. Uh, and um, when, I, when I say one for activity, one for relaxing, again, uh, more and more uh, the technology is uh, getting to the place where it can be yet still more nuanced than that. So because uh, the way that I um, became familiar with this world comes from the fact that I've uh, landed in the world of drop labs. Um, first, I'd just say a few words about um, how I uh, landed here, um, because some of you or many of you might have similar stories, you know, where you follow the bouncing ball. You know, I've, I've followed the bouncing ball in a lot of different ways, and actually it's all coming to a head uh, in a lot of ways right now, just everything that I've done from when I uh, first encountered uh, the Zen monastery uh, 30 years ago. Um, and then I became a, a high school English teacher. Uh, and then I actually for 15 years became a social justice educator uh, for 15 years through a confluence of events that led me then to understand uh, the concept of trauma and intergenerational trauma and the trauma that comes from systems that don't work, uh, systems that are harmful. Uh, and uh, so then I came to LA and became a therapist. I, I'm from New York originally, came to LA and became a therapist. And then as a therapist, um, my, my daughter, this might sound like it's uh, sideways, but it's, it's the way it happened. My daughter was in preschool and her uh, her friend, her little friend Tali, um, said her daddy worked at a place called Idea Lab, uh, which is a tech incubator here in Pasadena, a very famous one. And uh, I was brought in by her dad, Patrick, uh, to see about would we be able to come up with a wearable device, uh, a Fitbit for the emotions. That was their working sort of title for the project. And this is a lot of years ago. Um, and I came in and that's where I met Susan Paley, uh, former CEO of Beats by Dre and now the CEO of Drop Labs. And uh, what happened was we started working together. I said, yes, this is a thing. We, you should do it. Can I help? And so I've been in that world ever since. And we created that uh, product. And like I said, it didn't ever see the light of day. Uh, and then about four years ago, it was about a year in between, uh, Susan calls me up and she goes, she said, there, there's something I got, you got to try and I want you to try it as a therapist and a drummer, right? So not as a, as a, as a designer for sure. And um, I came in and actually the original prototype, you know, cause they were just trying to get the technology right. Um, the original prototype looked like uh, Neil Armstrong's, you know, one small step for mankind boots. And uh, really things were just getting started at the company that was, you know, wasn't, wasn't a lot of furniture. You know, and I, I came in and uh, there were these shoes and she said, sit down. I sat down. She said, put them on. I said, I put them on. She had an iPad. She said, put on these headphones. And she said, what do you want to hear? And I, and I was like, I have no idea what you are going to do to me. So um, you choose. And she knew, you know, I have, I have a very uh, wide uh, um, uh, taste in music. I love a lot of music. Uh, and one of the things she knew I loved was the uh, drumming of Keith Moon in The Who. So she put on a song called Bob O'Reilly. Um, by the way, I'm aging myself here at the moment. Um, but the, uh, the song came on, it starts with a synthesizer and I kind of felt a little vibration in my feet uh, during the beginning of the song. But then when the band kicked in, um, I, I, I literally jumped out of my seat and I was like flying around the room. And so that was my introduction to Drop Labs. And she said, what do you think? And I said, you can't have them back, number one. And number two, uh, I'm going to use this for EMDR therapy. And then very quickly, I realized, I think there's a lot of possible other implications. And so that's how I got involved. And that's also how a lot of other people got involved. So there's, uh, I guess what, what I'm saying is that there's a deep connection there's always, in my mind, um, there's a deep connection between fashion and wellness, um, just fashion in and of itself. Um, but the combination of fashion and tech towards the good um, is uh, very powerful. 
and that uh, saw the possibilities very quickly. So just a little bit about you know, this particular manifestation. Um, that, is the, that is the trainer um, uh, pictured there. Uh, so um, the, the uh, hardware and software takes the audio and um, puts it through the feet and uh, not in a random way, but uh, with our knowledge of you know, where, the, uh, where vibrations will impact uh, different parts of the body and the brain. Um, so this, this is the first product, um, the EP01. And uh, what happens is the phone streams the audio to the sneakers, and then uh, the full audio goes into the headphones. And so you're basically getting uh, an in-body based experience. And I'll, I'll tell you this, um, like with a lot of wearable technology, um, uh, and this kind in particular, uh, I, you can't really understand it until you, you actually feel it. But I can tell you that the most common uh, thing that many people say is it's like having a subwoofer in your feet. And again, it's, it's not like a random sort of uh, bunch of sensations. It's like I, uh, when I listened to that Keith Moon uh, and The Who, I heard notes that uh, Moon played that I had never heard before, is that kind of thing, where um, the fact is that we actually do uh, feel uh, sound, um, that uh, where we hear not just through our ears, but we hear with our body. We, and in particular, uh, there's a, a lot of um, sensors in our feet uh, that were po possibly probably used uh, before uh, people wore shoes, uh, or when you don't wear shoes, you might even notice this, that, that you know, there's, there's more sensitivity. And what this does is it kind of reignites that sensitivity uh, from the ground up. Uh, so this is the first one using the technology. And uh, right now, uh, you can see, you know, it does have some depth to the, um, uh, to, uh, the soul. Um, uh, and that is because all the technology is in there. Um, and uh, at the moment, we have six hours battery life, which actually, uh, for those of you in London, um, I don't know if I can get from LA to London on a full charge, but I know I can fly to New York from LA and be able to use uh, my shoes um, the whole way. Uh, so uh, starting up on the sort of the left, top left of your screen, uh, so the, the audio plays, the phone streams the sound to the shoes via Bluetooth. The shoes play the sound as vibrations. Uh, and then it's it, at simultaneously with very little latency uh, streams the sound to the headphones uh, via the Bluetooth and the headphones play the sound. And then you can adjust the intensity. You can adjust their filters uh, that, you know, help you to enjoy music, meditative soundscapes, movies, you know, there's setting uh, for uh, watching movies where uh, the human voice uh, frequencies are less connected to, uh, to uh, the shoes. And so you're getting the background in, in the shoes, um, uh, but not the human voice, which uh, makes for, especially when you're watching a movie on, on your little screen, um, for a more uh, intense, uh, uh, experience of, of watching the film. And also there's a uh, gaming uh, attachment, you know, with gaming uh, folks are not gonna uh, put up with uh, the latency of Bluetooth. And so there's connectors that make it so that there it's extremely low uh, latency. And so the gaming experience becomes uh, more intense. Uh, so um, just to say that uh, across all the platforms that you might think of this being uh, an enhancer of experience, uh, those are all in play and people are uh, experimenting with it. And a, a big part of what has been wonderful about the Drop Labs experience is that they, they, from the beginning, they see themselves as a platform for people to go, hey, I think we could do this with this shoe and have at it, go for it kind of, uh, uh, thought, like um, how can we leverage this technology? And then with Drop Lab's mission being to further refine, further enhance, further, uh, further make manifest uh, different aspects of the technology that can uh, help people. 
So uh, one of the, uh, I, I, can't, I, I have to say, I can't remember where I sourced this article. It's a very recent article where they're like, enough with the ugly watch bands, Apple. It was someone who had a, a, a you know, was not happy with the latest generation of, of um, Apple watch bands. And, and the fact is, there's my friend Casio there in the middle. Um, the fact is, um, it, you know, we now have the technology is, as you can see, even with the ones like the Chicard and, and others, where there's a sensor that's like this big that can be embedded in the shirt. Um, it can be embedded in the shirt, let's say, in a way where it's unobtrusive uh, and or uh, it can be highlighted if you want to highlight the fact that your shirt can track your fitness. Uh, or, or provide some kind of interventions that uh, help you with your meditation or any of those kind of things. And so uh, I think, you know, with the, with the way that we now can make digital uh, so small or make it so part of the fabric, there's no reason why uh, fashion cannot uh, take a front seat in the smart connected fashion world. And so, you know, I'm showing you the, the, the trainer and uh, you might have a variety of feelings and thoughts about um, how it looks. Uh, but um, I, I will tell you that um, a number of um, uh, folks in the footwear, veterans in the footwear uh, industry had a hand in uh, advising on this and even designing uh, because and, and again, this is uh, where I came in, how I came in and how a lot of people came into this project is, oh my goodness, this might help people. How can I be involved, right? So there's the entertainment aspect, there's the fashion aspect, and then there's, there's the aspect of uh, how can we use technology to help. Um, so you can see that the, you know, the, um, the fashion, uh, looks not that much unlike, you know, a lot of uh, the, uh, many trainers on the market and, um, and has the extra uh, bulk, although it's not uh, super heavy. I can tell you that from, from wearing them a bunch, you know, I was a beta tester for a long time and, and I use them in, in my day-to-day -day life. So, um, so, uh, and there, there it's deconstructed for you. Um, so you can see uh, where the technology rests. It's all there in, in the midsole. And um, that allows for the rest of the trainer to be dedicated to being a trainer. So just as an example, the kind of the first and most uh, long standing example of uh, how uh, smart connected fashion can uh, develop over time is there was a realization uh, that um, folks in the hard of hearing community and the deaf community uh, do their uh, majority of their, obviously they do their hearing through their body. And um, Antoine Hunter, who is a wonderful choreographer, deaf choreographer and dancer uh, from the Bay Area here uh, in the States, San Francisco area, um, he, uh, talked about having like speakers all over his studio, all over his apartment in order to listen to music. And, uh, you know, uh, talked about the struggles uh, or the difficulties in um, being able to uh, lead his dance company. And, the, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the technology that is needed in order to, for instance, uh, when they do a performance, uh, his company, uh, there'll be speaker technology built into the stage uh, and that's how the dancers work and so he put them on and he was he was oh my goodness and uh, so he has been from the beginning uh, at the forefront of helping to even uh, to fine-tune even further how and where and what uh, the vibrations uh, are about and um, he he's said a number of things about what this has done for him first of all just a whole ton of joy and deeper ability to uh, hear music. Um, but what he uh, uh, talked about too, for instance, was how uh, when he was leading his dance company before he had the shoes, he would have a hard time finding his place in a song if he stopped a song in the middle. Um, and now with the shoes, it's so much more directed 
that he can stop and start and be able to pick it up. Um, but also just the, uh, what, what I've been able to, to witness uh, with people who are deaf or are hard of hearing, when they put on the shoe, uh, some folks, um, uh, many generations of um, hearing impaired. Uh, so music uh, appreciation, what was not necessarily at the center of their family life. And they put these on and it uh, changed, changed the game. So <clears throat> uh, I already uh, talked about, in a sense, some of uh, what the challenges are in um, making decisions about smart connected fashion, developing it. And these are some of the sort of the touch points that Drop Labs <clears throat> came across uh, from the beginning. First of all, it's integrating the fashion with the technology in a way uh, that is both uh, functional and fashionable. Um, you know, Susan uh, Paley came to this, as I said before, as the uh, former CEO of Beats by Dre, and she had a long history in the audio hardware business uh, before that. So that's the portal she came through. Uh, and she's a, an appreciator of fashion and appreciator of a good, uh, a good trainer, but um, that's, that wasn't her, uh, her first area. So uh, there was, um, so folks who are coming to Smart Connected Fashion from the technology end have that learning curve. Folks who are coming from the fashion side have that, you know, the other learning curve, let's say. Some people have it all connected already. Um, but in this case, it was about, okay, here we have the technology, we know it works in a giant moon boot. Um, how, do we, uh, how do we combine um, and integrate and make it, make it uh, something that people want to wear? Um, so um, manufacturing, uh, you know, uh, uh, electronics factories are highly robotic or uh, intensive on robotics. And shoe factories, are, footwear factories are often still uh, highly uh, reliant on um, on human uh, interaction with the fabric and with the uh, with the shoe, and so having those two methodologies come together, or you know how how to finish uh, that product, and then there's also uh, keeping up with the constantly changing technology. Um, one of the things that I'm learning uh, very deeply in my uh, master's in uh, healthcare innovation program at uh, University of Pennsylvania is that if I try to uh, design or innovate towards a particular piece of technology, uh, I may get three to six months of uh, use out of that. In other words, I have to more be thinking about other aspects of what it is that I'm working with. For instance, the fashion, um, and have the technology feed into that because the technology is always changing. And so that's been one of the most, for me, one of the most uh, fun things about working uh, with Drop Labs is um, the way that we're just seeing how we can keep up with the technology and leverage the technology just to make it better and better. Um, so then there was, of course, you know, how do we get it from moon boot to what you see in front of you, you know, how to come up with the best design that also um, supports the electronics. And so, so far, um, the product launched in, uh, I think it was November. Uh, and uh, so, um, so there was some, we had some experience of um, putting it out there uh, before the pandemic. Um, and so, uh, we're about to, or Drop Labs is about to relaunch, in a sense, or restock. Um, our, you know, the next wave of product is coming in in the next couple of weeks, actually. It's very exciting to be here with you uh, on the cusp of that. Um, so, uh, so far, very low returns, um, and which is, you know, for a piece of electronics, piece of fashion, you know, either one. Um, uh, the fact is that people are, are, are reporting that they're experiencing what it is they pay for. And so um, we haven't been getting a lot of returns. People are reporting, and I get to see this when we uh, do demos at the, uh, our office in Echo Park here in Los Angeles. Um, people are just having these experiences with movies, uh, gaming, and wellness, and music. And a lot of that had to do with um, Susan and their team really just not leaving any stone 
unturned uh, when it came to design and uh, you know, just the, the, the whole package. So uh, one thing uh, I will say, you, you saw that the, the trainer is, it's black and it has a little bit of uh, white trim um, and the, uh, the logo, the Drop Labs logo is kind of embedded uh, onto the trainer. Um, and a lot of the look of the, um, of the original, of the first sneaker and uh, the second and third versions are coming out soon. Um, again, a couple of weeks, maybe uh, a month. Um, but uh, veterans in the footwear fashion world said to Susan and the team, like, keep it simple at first. Um, in, order, in other words, um, you can make a simple fashion statement um, but, you know, if you focus on supporting the electronics and having the electronics shine first, having the uh, Bluetooth uh, um, experience uh, be at the forefront um, and then move from there. But I think that, um, uh, going back to that slide, uh, that last bullet point, this advice uh, may not be universal. I think it was, uh, more will be revealed over time in terms of how people, again, enter this stream of smart connected fashion. Um, so, uh, you know, it might flip at times, uh, this advice, um, depending, uh, I think, as the electronics get more and more uh, refined, um, people will be able to, to, to do that. Um, so, uh, smart connected fashion and wellness are intimately tied. You know, Apple Watch, Fitbit, other products are all designed to try and increase uh, or encourage wellness. Uh, and our wellness possibilities that we found um, is that uh, the feet are so, have so much uh, going on um, uh, that we're possibly looking at an improvement in terms of the wellness possibilities. That's what we're looking at. We, we can't, uh, we don't have enough research data to say whether it's so or not yet. Um, but that the wrist or the finger is a great place, but the feet are really uh, an incredible place because we hear, we ground ourselves, we connect with the earth through our feet. And we have a huge concentration of sensory receptors there. And so drop labs could essentially possibly uh, track, you know, be a tracking a device in the same way that Fitbit and Apple Watch are, uh, and also provides interventions. And some of those interventions are really just about um, you know, uh, the joy that comes with music and cinema and gaming and VR. Um, I haven't talked about that yet, but, um, you know, combining it with VR. Uh, so if you're listening to a meditative soundscape, your fa favorite artist's new single, um, an old movie, you know, whatever it is, it's a joy enhancer. So I'm going to get a little more specific for a little bit. Um, uh, coming towards the end of a presentation and I'm absolutely uh, thrilled to uh, do uh, some Q&A uh, if, if there's any. Um, but um, one, like I said, the first th thought that I had was, I'm gonna use this for EMDR therapy to treat trauma. I've been an EMDR therapist, eye movement desensitization reprocessing since 2005, since 2015, I've been training EMDR therapists. Uh, and uh, soon after I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to help me with PTSD treatment. A lot of other people started going, what, would, what, what might the implications be for autism, for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, addiction, another focus of mine, uh, depression. Um, and so uh, uh, people on the Drop Labs team, uh, people associated with my company and people associated with universities and companies across the spectrum, are all looking at ways to leverage perhaps their software, their technology, uh, and then leverage the hardware to help people. Um, and so for instance, um, right now, uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, during uh, this uh, reboot of uh, the civil rights movement, uh, which I like many hope uh, results in actual lasting change. Um, but one of the things that has been so uh, imperative is that people who uh, people are able to find ways to ground themselves to find their way to mental health and wellness in the midst of an ongoing crisis situation uh, and so that's one of it's very simple and it's not it's it's, it's almost less mental health and more just mental wellness 
uh, and just being on this earth in, in the midst of upheaval, like what do I need? And sometimes I just need my music, right? And if I can have a more in-depth uh, version of that, uh, that is good for my mental health. So that, that's at the baseline. Um, and so we can curate our own experience through, uh, through this kind of wearable tech. And then if you go to therapy, um, uh, your therapist can uh, uh, have uh, new platforms and new ways of uh, working smarter, uh, uh, working better. For instance, um, with uh, the pandemic, we've seen a lot more uh, of treatment being delivered online, right? And um, uh, I'm doing all my therapy right now virtually. And so if the um, client has uh, technology like this on their feet or any other kind of technology like this that uh, further enhances their sort of connection, right? Their body connection to the experience. It can, and, and ha perhaps having it connected to uh, the sound of their therapist's voice or uh, an intervention that the therapist is delivering uh, remotely. Um, so there's all kinds of implications that, again, are in progress, in process. Uh, one of the things uh, that's, uh, you know, I don't look at it like silver lining. I just look at it as what happens when you have something uh, like COVID-19 is you end up with a lot of innovation and a lot of change. And um, so, um, so it's an opportunity in that way for, for us to um, really work on finding new ways to uh, help people. So I'm already using it and I have some colleagues already using it in uh, EMDR. Um, uh, those of you not familiar with, with EMDR therapy, uh, essentially it, the eye movement that it speaks of as rapid eye movements back and forth were seen to be associated with the reprocessing of traumatic material. That'd be a whole other hour uh, or more uh, workshop to, to go further, but it's, a, it's an important part of the therapy. It's a part of the therapy. It's not the only mechanism of action. But anyway, um, the, the experience that I had was um, 1989, Francine Shapiro uh, developed the therapy. 1990, her first uh, visually impaired person came in and couldn't do the eye movements. And so she tapped on their knees. So ever since, um, people have used uh, audio or, and or tactile um, as well as the eye movements, you know, just vibrations going back and forth. And so that was the first implication that I experienced. And then the second implication that I experienced uh, as it pertains to EMDR is that um, a lot of what we do in EMDR is resource people, you know, make them more, help them to become more resilient and providing them with ways of doing that, most of which come from themselves, right? That the client is the expert on the client and we work with what they already have, but then we enhance that. And this, one of the ways we can enhance that is by uh, putting this technology uh, to use. Um, and so uh, there are universities, Emory University uh, has a number of people working on projects around a variety of difficulties and disorders. University of Pittsburgh as well. Um, at the University of Pennsylvania, I've only really just begun to kind of touch into uh, ways that uh, my cohort and uh, the alumni uh, of the program, it's a very young program, it's only three years old, um, uh, that uh, all of them uh, are bringing to the table uh, different ways that we might use the technology uh, to help. Um, there have been private neurofeedback companies that are also doing research and finding ways to take uh, those kind of um, pulses and sensations and deliver them through uh, the footwear. And then also in combination with virtual reality. Uh, for instance, just at a very basic level, uh, you know, when you do virtual reality, sometimes, especially if it's very, like you're flying through the air or anything like that, um, that uh, you can get nauseous. Um, and that when combining it with footwear like this, you can eliminate that or uh, greatly reduce it based on the fact that the, the vibrational technology through the feet helps you to place yourself in space. Uh, the fact is when you're doing VR, you lose that body, accurate body sensation of, of where you are in space and the brain and the body react. And so when you combine it uh, with the footwear. So again, that makes uh, for the possibility of VR being more uh, enjoyable, but also 
putting those together, what are the, some of the interventions that we can do uh, wellness wise? So my company, Start Again, um, uh, does a lot of things, training and uh, education and, and, and the rest of it, um, but also now have a software uh, company where we're uh, independently trying to develop uh, and design, uh, for instance, uh, EMDR interventions. Um, and we're also uh, working with partners um, who want to uh, work together to um, uh, help uh, along the possibilities in wellness and health um, with uh, the footwear. And so our first app was the, uh, is our EMDR therapy app. Um, and um, the, the key being uh, that uh, it is the first, um, uh, the first EMDR technology. Uh, at the bottom of the trainer there are some of the ways that uh, EMDR technology has been delivered, both wired and wireless. Uh, light bars and just headphones and pulsers. Um, and so those deliver the bilateral stimulation. And the thing that I love about Drop Labs as an EMDR intervention is that it also provides the resourcing. So um, when I've used it in my office, um, I uh, found that majority of the clients were like, this is cool. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it was effective and it also provided a little more motivation for the therapeutic process. Um, anything that kind of makes it more engaging or engaged uh, is helpful for therapy. And also uh, anything that empowers the client. So when they have the technology on them, uh, they uh, I noticed, and I'm going to continue to look at, uh, they feel empowered. They feel like it's a part of them. Um, so. Uh, a majority of the clients used it to resource by listening to their music or, or, or meditate with soundscapes. Um, and then uh, also the, the using the bilateral stimulation, slow bilateral helps to develop resources and then fast bilateral helps to um, reprocess the, the traumatic memories. So uh, when it was used for resourcing and when it was used for reprocessing, it either matched uh, the efficacy that we see in the EMDR literature um, and or it, it improved it, like it never took it down a notch. And so um, our initial in, uh, investigations are showing that is at least a, a significant addition uh, to the other ways that people deliver bilateral stimulation. Um, so looking forward, um, which is what we're all doing, um, I hope, uh, is uh, our hope is to continue to uh, work with this technology, work with this hardware to de develop, uh, deliver new interventions, but also new fashion opportunities. Um, that is, you know, that's what the company is doing. Um, uh, what Drop Labs is doing and what Start Again is doing, what we're all doing, uh, who any of us in, in the smart connected fashion world at all, is we want to create a greater uh, fashion opportunities. And my goal is to connect people in all the different ways I can, either from producing products or uh, retailing or being part of you know, person to person networking, et cetera. Um, and, and the goal is too, how can we use this technology across the spectrum of healthcare? And I, I mean mental health and physical health, um, meaning that how can it help the person who doesn't need any kind of treatment, you know, just looking for more wellness, all the way through the person who needs acute care, you know, uh, like if someone needs to detox from opiates, how can it help them? And then how can it help that person as they go through their treatment um, and how, uh, and as they go uh, forward into their fabulous life uh, of, uh, of uh, wellness, uh, over the long haul. So uh, the goal is to, to help people to enter the stream of smart connected fashion, meeting people where they are and having a portal that people can enter at any place to find uh, the benefits of this. So I just actually surprised myself with my final slide. Um, uh, I really uh, appreciate um, your uh, attending today. I hope uh, that um, whether you're Zoom, Facebook Live, watching this on a replay, 
Um, I hope it was helpful in some way uh, in understanding uh, this world of smart connected fashion. And uh, I look forward to um, meeting some of you along the way, collaborating, I hope. Um, and there is my information. And that last wish there are, uh, um, I didn't talk so much about, uh, if at all, about uh, Buddhist psychology, but um, uh, that is at the center of how I work. And those are four phrases from a loving kindness meditation. Um, so may you be free from fear, may you be healed or healthy, may you be happy and may you be at ease. Um, so uh, I will uh, unshare my screen, I suppose, and um, see if we have some questions. Um, okay, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Anya. Fantastic. Hello again, Steve. So that was a really, really uh, interesting and really stimulating talk. Uh, I made so many notes. There was honestly so many different things that I was just like, what, this is real? Like, like people are actually doing these things. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so thank you so much for delivering such an incredible and insightful and informative talk. I'm sure everybody who was watching uh, will really appreciate and you know, will really have something to take away from that. Um, so I actually, there are quite a few questions here for you actually. So I don't know if you'll want to keep your answers just a little concise so we can get through as many as possible. But um, the overall theme seems to be uh, a lot of intrigue and a lot of interest um, from the people who are watching. So um, there are some commendations actually that have been left for you and people just say how much they're enjoying the talk. So, um, so I'll get straight into the first question, comment slash question from Nicholas who asked, um, he said, I have to say this is really interesting. Um, what I'm wondering is what is happening with the data collected from, uh, from, in, and on these wearables? It seems as though personal privacy is being forsaken, perhaps, and uh, somebody somewhere is collecting a trove of information. Do you have any idea what they're doing with it? 100%. It's a great question. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the um, uh, courses, the most recent courses that I uh, was taking at Penn, um, had to do with uh, connected architectures and the fact that we live now in uh, a world where sometimes actually pay with data, right, for a product, right, that maybe they won't get charged any money. And what it is that the company is interested in is data. And so the whole uh, spectrum of privacy uh, issues is, is growing and growing and growing to the point where um, I mean, think about it, right? Um, what does Alexa know if you have Alexa? What does my watch know? What does all of it know? So this is one of the primary issues of being a, a technology company requires uh, building a relationship of trust and transparency about the data, what the data is used for, and only using the data for the purposes of continuing to help uh, people and continuing to um, uh, um, uh, refine uh, what it is that we do with these products in order to um, help you. So the idea is, right, uh, a company would take the data and that would help them to customize the product or products for you uh, so that they would work better for you and that there'd be more opportunities to, um, to create wellness. And then there is, and there is the, the problem of, or one of the biggest uh, areas of commerce right now is people selling data, right? Yeah. So that's why there needs to be uh, this, uh, it needs to be a very, very transparent and direct to the consumer uh, conversation about your question, Nicholas. You know, it needs to be a big part of it. So, so... Um, depends on the company, right? I mean, there's the huge companies, Apple and Google and the rest of them, and Amazon, uh, who knows what they're doing with my data is the feeling that Facebook. I have. Yes, Facebook, oy vey, you know, hi, Facebook, right? So, um, so there's, there's all that. And then um, there's uh, how do we take that data, the bi bio data and other data, that you provide, let's say through a text messaging back and forth with a company, 
uh, to provide them with more information about how you're feeling, what you need, you know, all those. So, you know, smaller companies that are more wellness oriented like ours, that's what we're focused on, right? We want the data to, so that we can help you. Um, but, and then we, then it's on us too, to protect that data, right? Which is, means a whole other level of the business, right? Which is to protect your data. So thank you for the question, it's really important. So I have a comment from Warder. She says, wow, I have learned so much today. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you to Dr. Dams again, everyone who made this masterclass possible. Thank you for that comment, Warder. Um, I have a question from Vukola who wants to know. Um, so she says, uh, some people think that smartware uh, still remains bulky and it looks too technological. Uh, and not very fashionable. So how can we move past this and sort of improve this, uh, this ugly perspective? Yes. So I, you know, again, my journey with, uh, with smart connected fashion and with drop labs has been, you know, it's like, hi, I'm a therapist. I'm a drummer. <laughs> I think we could do great things with this. And I love a good trainer, uh, but I wouldn't even know where to begin. Right. And, and Susan and others on the team, you know, very similar. Um, it's kind of like, oh my goodness, you know, how can we get uh, this, uh, the sensors, how can we get the vibrational technology small enough, compact enough, but still powerful enough so that then we can debulk uh, the fashion aspect. And so, you know, it, it's that, you know, you think about um, I don't know how many of you remember or, you know, you see it in, in videos and films, you know, the original cell phones or pre-cell phones, like satellite phones <laughs> like this. Um, so, you know, as things get smaller and smaller, then the opportunities come more and more, I think, on the wearable side and, and, and enable us to, to think uh, more fashionably in our choices. And so that's been a lot of the Drop Labs journey. And, and then the other companies that are working on similar, you know, sort of projects and have, you know, Adidas, Nike, they all have uh, technology embedded in some of their trainers. And so they're, it's, it's all in the service of, uh, first of all, with a trainer, it's wellness. Like that, that has to really take care of you more than, a, let's say, a shirt or something like that. A shirt takes care of you in terms of uh, breathability and 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 the looks and how I feel mm. in that shirt, but the trainers that's like a bio, biological need that it needs to be dealt with. So anyway, um, I think that the future is friendly around this, and I think I pointed out in one of the slides that I think you know like at first it's sort of like we had to build the fashion to the electronics, and we're getting more and more to the place where we can build the electronics to the fashion or that the fashion thought that you might have, we might be able to just have it become a, a, a you know, wearable tech. Mm. So it's gonna, be, it's gonna be an exciting next decade, let's say. Okay, so um, I have some questions here from Jennifer. Um, I think I will just say, so towards the end, she did comment, uh, maybe my above questions aren't relevant anymore since uh, the product is still in the prototype stage, but it looks like a great product. But I'm going to just ask the questions anyway, just thought I should you know, add that bit of context. Um, so she asked, first of all, can the sensors be affordable for small and medium sized businesses to incorporate into their designs? And if yes, what company can we approach for it? Mm. So I wouldn't be able to give the I can start with the Drop Labs answer. First of all, Drop Labs is, uh, you know, is um, a small company. Um, it, it actually, we launched in November. It's, no, it's not a prototype. People are buying the shoes. So you can go to droplabs.com and surf around and, and see what's there. Um, uh, and so that technology is proprietary to the Drop Lab shoe. And it remains to be seen, you know, how uh, how that's going to uh, propagate um, over time in terms of, you know, uh, Drop Labs itself becoming just a larger company or, uh, you know, doing um, uh, uh, partnerships with Nikes and Adidas's of the world, all, all that, like all of that's, you know, happening. And so um, there are other small companies, either with proprietary sensor technology 
or who are leveraging, uh, th there's a lot of different versions of the technology out there. Um, and so, um, I, I, as a matter of fact, I'm familiar with, I have a friend who has come up with new pulsar technology uh, for EMDR therapy. Um, and I don't know what's um, uh, new about it because it's proprietary and we haven't had that conversation yet, um, you know, about the ins and outs of it. Um, so there's many small companies that are developing that kind of technology that you might be able to uh, get in touch with. Um, getting in touch with a company like Drop Labs to see how your design, if, if you're a designer, uh, you know, looking to see how you could collaborate, you know, with, because, you know, um, the footwear is just the best place where this technology works in terms of uh, delivery of sound and vibration. Um, but of course, we're looking at how to leverage it in a number of different ways, right? Like, how do we do that? So there are small companies and large companies. There's, uh, you know, a number of different places you could go to investigate that. And if you get in touch with me, I'm glad to continue that kind of conversation. Um, I'm, I'm best on email. Email is where I don't lose things. Oh, I'm the complete opposite. My emails oh, are right. a mess, yes. <laughs> my texts, my texts are a huge farm of like unfinished conversations, but my emails I get to. So I have another question from Jennifer. So she wants to know, do you have any thoughts on how these sensors in clothing could help people who are poor and marginalized in Africa? Could it become an essential household item? And if yes, what ideas do you have for rolling out? Mm. So that is, that is the goal, right? Or my, my, my goals uh, with my own company and the work that I do in mental health, the training, the therapeutic modalities that I train people in, uh, the whole goal is to increase access. And increasing access means, I, I, I mean globally, like how do we uh, bring this to as many people as possible? When I say this, I mean, any and all mental health and wellness interventions that are not necessarily being delivered in marginalized communities. Um, and uh, same with the technology. And so the way that I see it, right, this is a first gen product. The first gen products are always uh, bulkier. Uh, I, I don't find the trainer super bulky, but it's bulkier than it's gonna be. Um, they're bulky and they're also more expensive because the, you know, the technology is new. But I don't know, uh, my experience has been that second gen of just about everything, like the price cuts in half, et cetera. Yeah. And so for, from where I'm, so, so then the question about how to roll it out, um, I don't know the whole Drop Labs plan. I know the part of the plan that's related to the work that I'm doing, where they are working with me to uh, cut prices and be able to deliver in bulk um, to, uh, for instance, addiction rehab centers that, uh, are not, uh, that are in communities far and wide, as opposed to just, you know, um, uh, luxury rehabs and things like that, right? And so, you know, um, uh, little by little, but faster, as fast as possible, finding the business models that combine um, anything to do with uh, um, uh, the for-profit side of the business, um, also having a nonprofit uh, side of the business that helps in the uh, wider distribution of this. So I'm actually currently, I'm in meetings with folks who are hearing my plea for this to be on the front end of how we roll things out rather than the back end. Um, so it's all happening right now. So uh, my, my feeling is, my thought is, again, you know, I'm, I'm willing to consider that we didn't develop the best product, right? I think we've developed a wonderful product. Um, uh, I'm willing to consider that uh, there's gonna be something better out there uh, and or something that's easier for people to access. But I think that there's a, a good opportunity here for this to be at the front end of reaching more people and it could become a household item. It's a matter of, um, continuing to refine the product and also the business model and, and uh, how to um, make sure that it gets distributed and make sure that folks uh, have the access to the software as well, right? I mean, it's, it's easier to deliver software 
as it were, but at the same time in marginalized communities, you know, we talk about all the other aspects, internet access and all the rest of it in order to create um, the same opportunities in those communities that, um, that others may have. So it's a, it's a priority and it's in process. Okay, so I think we're just gonna take one more question. Um, so we have a question here from Anonymous who is wondering about sustainability and waste and where the materials are sourced. Uh, she, uh, sorry, Anonymous says long-term thinking about waste for the planet as far as fair trade in manu manufacturing. Yeah, so um, the, the sustainability aspect is uh, as, um, let's put it this way, it's on the front end of the thinking. And at this point, technology and Bluetooth technology and digital technology is is not super sustainable. Um, the, the goal is to, uh, I think, to minimize, and again, this is not my expertise also. I mean, I, I, I like uh, any good citizen, my feelings about sustainability and climate change, I do everything that I can to participate correctly and with this uh, product and other things that I do. Um, it's, it's absolutely at the front end. Um, it's minimizing the harm and maximizing the, uh, what the product can do to help with sustainability. So uh, meaning that um, on the physical sustainability side or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the damage that is done to, like immediately um, when making a product, you know, um, minimizing that harm while maximizing what the product does in order to uh, bring sustainability forward. So, so I, I'm thinking that if you have electronics like this that, um, and, and fashion uh, like this that, um, that impacts people in a positive way that helps them to develop more wellness, which helps them to develop more awareness, which helps them to then make different decisions about sustainability in their lives, right? Like there's a lot of layers to this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I wish I could say uh, that um, there's a perfect answer to that. Um, but, and, and again, not my expertise and actually you've given me something to um, go back to Susan and Drop Labs to, to see where the conversation is right now and then maybe participate a little more deeply in that part of the conversation. So um, thank you for the question. Wow, so this has been an absolutely incredible talk. Um, thank you so much once again to Dr. Steve Danzinger for being here, for waking up so early. If you didn't know, uh, he's actually hosting this talk from America. So for those of us in the UK, Nigeria, wherever else, he's like six or so hours ahead in his day than we are. Um, but still on top form as expected. It was such an incredible, incredible talk. Um, I would like to say just before we round off, um, that uh, everybody watching, please do remember that Africa Fashion Week London, along with the Masterclass series, has online courses called Fashion Futures, which is in partnership with Henry's Business School in the UK and Parsons Design Schools in New York. And we also have scholarships available, so do uh, head over to uh, our website, AfricaFashionWeekLondonUK.com, I believe, um, for more information on that. Uh, Dr. Steve, thank you so much once again. Do you have any final parting words, any information you want to share, contact details, uh, just before we close officially? Yeah, just um, please do get in touch. Um, I love uh, collaborating. I love uh, helping. I love any opportunities to continue to interact on this level. So please don't hesitate, steve at drdanziger.com, or if you just go to the website, there's a contact uh, there. And I want to thank you, Eniape. I want to thank the entire uh, Africa Fashion Week London team for uh, doing this and for inviting me. So it's been a, a pleasure and I really uh, appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you once again. Thank you to everybody for watching and we will see you next time. Bye.